Blair, welcome to the Mary's Cup of Tea podcast. Thanks so much for making time to be here. Thank you so much, Mary. I'm a longtime listener, first time interviewee. Excited about it. Can I start with a story that I heard through a mutual friend, our mutual friend, Jake, he has been on this podcast. So my listeners might be familiar with him because he's quite the personality as well. Um, And he told me something that had happened one of the first times that he met you. And I wanted to hear it from your perspective, because I think it's just very telling as to who you are as a person and what you do, especially for my listeners who are unfamiliar with you. Can I start there? Oh, yeah, let's do that. You're like, I don't even remember what this story is, but he basically- I don't, because me, every time we have, we I interact with Jake, it's like the most memorable moment. So I'm like, which one? That is very true. Well, he told me about how you, um, you had just met, or this was like one of your few times meeting, you came to Imaloa for a familiarization trip because- you being you doing your due diligence about a retreat center. And I'm really happy and just like, I feel extra connected to you knowing that you went with Imaloa because it's such a special place for me and my retreats. But he it's told a really me about- intentional space. It is. Yes. And then I know he's always talked about it. And obviously, you know, Jake and I are friends behind the scenes and I'm pretty certain of it too. But knowing- how deeply you researched it and I mean research not just a google search what they put on their website but like you went in and talked to every single staff member I did in Spanish it's it's like my parents are both like they have a social work background so I'm always coming in with that lens but anyway what's the story well the story is there was an instance with I think some white people there I I'm assuming that they're white and it was an instance of racism I don't know the details but he said that you very swiftly, I believe is the word that he used to describe it. You very swiftly use it as a opportunity to educate and it created a learning experience for everybody. And I know that as a black person, this is something you don't really have the luxury of avoiding. And more often than not, it's like free emotional labor, but I'm wondering like, can you share what happened? What was the instance? Cause I don't know any of the details and I feel like it would be very powerful for us white people to learn of an instance of racism showing up in a space where you'd think like everybody walks in very open and although they might be walking in like very open and and connected to their true intentions it's still like in like it's just in the bones it just comes out for us white people Oh, definitely. I'm glad that Jake brought this up because, you know, honestly, in hindsight, it was such a non-issue. But I think like what you said, like when you go on an experience, whether it's a retreat or familiarization trip, what have you, you kind of expect folks to be called to their best selves, the most intentional selves. And unfortunately, sometimes that means that there's, you know, residual work to do. And I think it honestly, like, it's really interesting. It actually didn't happen on the Imaloa campus, which I think is another layer because sometimes when everybody's getting assembled and everybody's in the airport, you're still seeing people like not in their most ascended self, but kind of in their most like vulnerable self, which sometimes causes them to lean into like things that they have unlearned. It's just kind of like what you see when somebody's at a Black Friday sale versus what they're doing when they're like at an Ostrom. Like, you know, you're seeing mm-hmm. kind of like two sides of the same person. I think that it has to do with culture shock, whatever, whatever. And I think I'm also somebody, you know, being Muslim, you know, we have the hadith of making a thousand excuses for somebody. Like, you know, maybe that's the person's worst day or like it was the worst interaction. It shouldn't like really define the person. Anyway, what essentially happened was, you know, when you go on any type of excursion, retreat, vacation, uh, even on just like a road trip, you're going to have a bunch of people who have the same interests in this case, like yoga, not always yoga, but like, you know, we're all here in Costa Rica. Um, And that doesn't mean that we all come from the same understandings, or that we, you know, whatever. Um, In this situation, the white folks were, you know, around the white folks and kind of had decided for whatever reason that any person of color wasn't on that same trip with them mind you it's a super small Mm -hmm. airport so it's kind of like yeah we are um and we were kind of noticing because it was like people were being very short with us and um it was just kind of like this could become something let's just nip it in the bud and I kind of sent Jake a, a whatsapp message just being like heads up we might have to like sort this out a little bit later and you kind of saw like the a little bit of embarrassment realizing oh snap we are all going into the same place but it was one of those moments where 
some people's personalities maybe weren't on yet, you know, and it's like, anyway, so what we ended up doing was checking in with the other like folks of color who were there seeing who wanted to be the ones to speak up. Um, I and uh, my co-facilitator, Susanna Barkataki, who we're going to be doing a retreat at MLO soon, um, we kind of decided to be the ones to kind of like speak up on it. And I think that it was, you know, ended up being a non-issue, but I think that it's also kind of a reminder that there's multiple things, right? Like not everybody who's in the same space as you has the same intentions as you. Not everybody's on the same part of their learning journey with you. And also some people look at anti-racism as a switch that you click on and click off. And when it's clicked off, you can definitely see somebody's true colors. And it's very alarming to me because sometimes I'll interact with folks who see me, like my, you know, myself online and they think that's a persona and then there's like the real me. I mean, I definitely cuss mm -hmm. more in real life than I do on the internet, but that's just because of the algorithm. Um, but for the most part, I'm the same person online as I am offline. And even when I talk to my own family members, I'll see people say like, oh, like there's definitely like you know, my online self and my personal self. And sometimes that online self is like the more marketable version of you. And for a lot of people, that means, you know, working with more diverse folks, but not actually having those folks in your friend group. And so I think that for my own sanity, and you talked about how it's like a lot of emotional labor for my own sanity, I'm like, hey, we're going to be together for a little while. Let's get on the same page that like that wasn't okay behavior that like, you know, self-selecting or deciding who you're going to like greet and who you're not going to greet and doing that along color and like race and bias lines is not cool. So for my own mental space, let's get this out of the way. Let's solidify it, but also making space so that not everybody who is affected by the interaction, like you were saying, has to be the one to volunteer. But because my work and Susanna's work is around anti-bias and anti-racism, we were like, okay, cool. Well, that's kind of what our retreat's about anyway. So we might as well sort it out ahead of time. And we had a very nice experience with, with many of the folks who kind of were more standoffish at the beginning. I'm sure it set a precedent for, like you said, that's why you were there. And that perfectly segues into my next question, which you kind of answered already. But when you're thinking about, I don't know if you're even making the decision or if it just comes naturally to you, but when you're thinking about like whether or not to bring something up or how to approach it. For example, you said that you do it because it's easier for you than to not do it. Right. Yeah. And I think that's weird for a lot of people to hear. Cause it's like, well, most folks, the reason why we're like, you know, stuff is so bad sometimes is because people are bystanders for me. I'm going to notice it. I'm going to think about it. It's going to be a dinner time thing. It's going to be a lunchtime thing. When I'm like, actually like doing a yoga practice, I'm going to be thinking about it. Then I'd rather just like answer the questions that I have in my mind and not create stories about a, a given situation and just try to clear up what's happening. Mm -hmm. um, maybe everybody was really jet lagged and they just happened to, I don't know, like who knows, you know, but I'd rather just like get ahead of it because it is so connected to my work that I don't want to spend times in places that might be problematic. And also if we have that kind of reset moment and there are people who were like, oh, that was total nonsense. I know not to talk to them. So it kind of like, brings it out yeah 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 that makes sense like everything is super transparent you're not tiptoeing you're also not it's even more emotional labor if you're the one internalizing it and overthinking it when it's really you know something for them to contend with um I'm wondering like where do you get, like what was your upbringing like where do you get like the courage the tenacity that one of the first things Jake told me about you is that you are exactly the same online as you are in person. That is <laughs> the first thing he said. And just like your extroverted nature, I think that's something like nature versus nurture will be here forever. But in terms of like courage, tenacity, like activism, like who are your parents? Like what, what is your upbringing? Like, I'm so interested. Well, I definitely come by it honestly. Like, I think one of the interesting things about being married is that you, you know, kind of find yourself, well, it depends on the person, but for me, you know, my parents are also married. So I'm like constantly thinking about like, like the roles that I play. And I'm like, I have the best of both of them and some of the things that I need to work on. I don't want to say the worst, but like I get all of the sides. But one thing I get, like, for example, um, there was like a, a school musical and there was one of the lines in the musical that was kind of derogatory to folks with disabilities. Like, you know, I can't remember what exactly what it was. And I remember like, 
uh, we had like a shared family computer. And I remember like going to my dad's computer to print out one of my papers and seeing that he wrote this whole like letter to the theater department talking about how that's problematic, how he works with folks with developmental disabilities and how that type of like, you know, language didn't add to the story could be removed easily. And I don't think I ever talked to him about it, but I was just like, you go dad. Like that was just kind of how he was. And uh, still is. And during the pandemic, my parents immediately were like, okay, which elders in our community can't get groceries themselves? Like, how can I show up? I was just like dissociating and playing Animal Crossing because I could not handle it. But my parents were just like, time to do the work. Um, my mom is somebody who will speak to the manager or any person in leadership for justice. Um, and it's just so cool. I think, especially that when I was a kid, they were very adamant about the fact that like, if you hear something that your teacher says that feels wrong or sounds wrong, feel free to challenge them. Um, and I think what that was, was my parents trying to protect me as the, you know, my family, we were like one of the only black families in the neighborhood. Um, and at the school, it was like me and my sister. And I think that as we got older, there was like increasingly handfuls of folks or, you know, families that would come to the school. Um, so they kind of meant like, if a teacher says anything racist, young Blair heard this as, if any teacher says anything wrong ever, like, uh, <laughs> I'm going to be like, actually, um, but that taught me how to speak back to authority and do that in a way that was respectful and like not interrupting, you know, even with the story that uh, I shared at the beginning, like, you know, that was something, you know, racism can be really casual. So I feel like when we have a response to it, it can be equally casual. I don't need somebody to cry and grovel on the floor and, you know, repent as a racist or whatever. I just need folks to be like, oh, yeah, actually, that was a behavior that I participated in. I am sorry about that. Or like even explain why, not to dismiss it, but like, let me know where you're coming from, you know, because in my mind, I'm seeing you're only talking to white folks. You're not talking to anybody else. Why is that? Did you assume there was a language barrier? You are in another country. Like there could be reasons and we can also take accountability. Um, but I learned that really early on. And I think another thing was having my younger sister, Chelsea, who's going to be in some smarter in seconds really soon. Um, she's autistic and bipolar and she uh, had um, like her process of like speaking was um, later than mine. You know, I spoke really early on and she spoke like a little later on, uh, according to like these are really arbitrary benchmarks, but it was also learning like how to advocate for folks and how to not, because I think a lot of folks are like, oh, I'll be a voice for the voiceless. And it's like, okay, well, sometimes we're thinking about that, but we're actually being a voice for people who are silent to actually have their own voice. So how do we amplify instead of talking over people? So I definitely came by it, honestly. Like I look at the principal that I had in elementary school and the teachers that I had and the essays that we were supposed to write. And I'm like, Oh yeah, no, this was definitely, there was no other way for me to be me <laughs> except for all of this. I love that. What did you end up studying in college or post-secondary? So I studied history and I, um, it was funny because I started out in political science and then we had to read this like memoir or book by like this conservative uh, journalist, like talking head. And I was like, I'm not doing this. And the teacher's like, well, you have to, it's for a grade. And I was like, <laughs> no. And so I, I dropped that class and then um, I shifted to Spanish and then the Spanish classes were super full. So I had to shift again. And then I did communications and the classes that were wide open were the history classes. And it was also really cool because I had a, a professor, Dr. Stater, Dr. Victor Stater, who he, in addition to looking like Bill Murray and being almost as legendary, no, he's probably more legendary than Bill Murray because I haven't met Bill Murray, but anyway, um, he would like really let me push back on things. And like, I was supposed to intern, I was supposed to do an unpaid internship to graduate, um, but it had to be in line with my area of study, which at the time was, you know, American history. Uh, and most of the American history museums that I could do an unpaid internship at were plantations and so when I went to Dr. Stater and I was like I don't feel comfortable doing an unpaid internship and he was like Blair it has to be an unpaid internship that's just how it is and I was like at a plantation and he was like totally understand so I feel like because it was like smaller classes and the teachers were so intentional it really helped me succeed um so yeah I finished with a degree in history and then I went to law school for seven weeks and I hated it so I dropped out and now I teach people on the internet Wow. Did it really happen like that straightforward? What was the in-betweens like when you dropped out of law school? I mean, so I like 
I didn't even go to my high, my uh, college graduation because I had to start orientation at law school. So it was very like, boop, boop, boom. Mm-hmm. Did the seven weeks. I was like, I hate this. And there was like a day to get your tuition back. And so I was like, yeah, we're doing that. Um, honestly, what it was was I babysat for um, a month and I called my uncle Marcus, who, you know, lives in the D.C. area. He's kind of he's very like well connected, like the political sphere. He does lobbying and my parents were like, well, you need to call Uncle Marcus and get a job. And I remember when I called him, he was like, Blair, you can't just drop out of law school and call Uncle Marcus and get a job. That's just not how the real world world works. And like two hours later, he called me and he was like, "Okay, so I have a job for you. (laughs) But he wanted to make (laughs) me sweat a little bit, you know. Um, And I remember babysitting uh, and it was so wild because when I did finally like get a job, um, kind of like more in line with like a career field, I was making so much more money babysitting, but I also like got to see, and I talk about this in my book, uh, read this to get smarter, like how differently people treat you based on what your job title is. Like, especially, I think uh, you've probably experienced this, like the, the, the people who you tell that you're an influencer versus like a healer versus like a podcast host or a producer, like they are going to react way differently. Um, so that was definitely something that I learned. Um, and it's one of those, it was one of those times where like, My mom, my whole life had told me like, you know, it's a man's world. It's a patriarchy. My mom's a huge feminist. That's why my name's Blair because it's a unisex name. Um, And I was like, sure, mom. Like, you know, like I believed her, but I was also like, it's different now. You know, like we have rights. (laughs) And um, I remember like seeing like just how male dominated uh, the workspace is and continues to be. This was the career in lobbying? Yes. How long did you stay there and during those two hours of sweating that you did, did you ever have like, I I don't know if I would call it a crisis, but did you, have you ever experienced in all of the many things that you do, all of the many interests and passions and just how educated you are in so many topics, do you ever struggle with being what they call, I think, multi-potentialite or multi-passionate? Oh yeah. Multi-potentiate or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I love, love that Ted talk by the way. Um, I really resonate with it, but like, yeah, what was those, what were those two hours of sweating like and any other sweating you've done in between? So I come from the mindset and like the family structure of not no, but next. And it can also almost be to a detriment that like in my family, we don't really take time to like grieve kind of like that something happened. It's kind of like, okay, well now what do we do to fix it? And I think Mm. it can be really advantageous because one of my friends was just telling me that uh, she's going to her therapist and she was really upset about something and she went to her therapist wanting sympathy. And her therapist was like, okay, but you just want to be upset. Children are upset. Adults get things done. And I was like, great. That's great. In that specific instance, probably not great for that to be the only way you respond to anything. (laughs) Like we all need balance. That's kind of how I grew up. Like I've seen my mom cry maybe three times. And I think like one was because she was mad one time, because you know, she was like really sad and didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. And the other time she didn't know what to do. And my mom says, I only cry when I don't know what to do. And crying can be for a variety of reasons. Um, I think it's also like hard trying to intergenerationally like talk about feelings and stuff, even when your parents have a mental health background, like my parents. Um, But I think the time, like that two hours, I was like, it's, you know, I was like, I'll figure something out. Like I was, I think during that time I was like starting to apply for like getting on that baby fitting like agency and stuff. Like, you know, you know, I'm young, I can still do stuff. I have my college degree, like I can plan, we can figure it out. I just knew I didn't want to do, um, I didn't know I was going to become an influencer, but I really didn't want to do law school. Cause I was like, that is not it. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was kind of like save yourself Blair at that moment. Uh, and then, but I think the time where I really did sweat and panic, but I kind of was doing that while making the plan was mm-hmm. during the pandemic, you know, my book, um, my second book, Making Our Way Home, which is a black history book that talks about, um, the migration patterns of black folks, the largest internal migration in us history of 6 million black people moving from the South in areas where they were brought because of enslavement and, you know, grew up because of enslavement and moving to places like Chicago and Detroit and Los Angeles. That came out in January 2020. Mm -hmm. And so I had been planning that I'm going to be, you know, coasting off of this big success. And like I had a 24 city tour in 28 days in February. Um, And then starting to see like 
oh, COVID is happening. COVID is real. Oh, masks are an important thing. Oh, also no planes and no travel. And oh, we're, we're home. We're just home now. Um, if you, you know, kind of had that privilege to have a home because so many unhoused people face more difficulty. Um, but it was also kind of this, you know, my parents immediately being like, okay, Blair, well, now that there's nothing to do, why don't you write another book? And I was like, my book just came out, like, you know, and really having to figure out, like, I had all these plans for the summer, and I had all these plans for the fall, and having to figure it out. But even then, I kind of had this plan where I was going to apply for a grant. Um, I'm on the board of Muslims for Progressive Values. And so I was going to apply for a grant to figure out a role that I could have there permanently, um, since I couldn't do like freelance speaking and writing as much. And um, what ended up really happening was I just got really like stagnated because I was just like, this is unprecedented. What is life? Like, it was so unfathomable for me. And Animal Crossing had just come out, like I already said. So I just like dove into Animal Crossing, completely detached from reality. Um, and then I think around in May, I realized, okay, well, that was fun, but I don't have any money left. <laughs> so what am I going to do? And I started to figure out, okay, can I take all of the materials that I've been creating through my books and put that on the internet? And that's kind of what brought me to being online. Mm, okay. I'm going to be stumbling because I have so many questions to ask you and so many things I want to talk about. Um, firstly, not no, but next. I've never heard of that. Is that similar to like rejection is redirection? Yes. I, and it's really like, uh, I think a mantra of like the black community, because for so many of like my relatives and, you know, I think in the black community at large, and I think also in the Jewish community, just seeing how often we can be rejected just based on people's biases about us, you have to have this like mantra of, okay, well, just because I didn't get accepted to this job, am I going to internalize that as the ultimate failure in the world? No, like, could they could have accepted me because I'm legitimately not qualified. Or it could be the 25 other reasons that they don't like me or my people or my last name or all these things. So like not know next might mean, okay, do I anglicize my my last name? Do I um, remove things? Like even Harvard did a study on whitening resumes and you basically take everything that indicates like my black student union, volunteering for these groups, like, and go and apply again. That's the no next. And then they found that people got more callbacks because there's just such discrimination. Um, and so it's kind of like figuring out a way around. If we can't go through, I'm going to go over, I'm going to go under, I'm going to go sideways and being really tenacious in that as a matter of survival. Um, because at the end of the day, you know, sometimes you have to pay bills or you have to, you know, even it could be in any context, but I think that often it's used in it, not just work, but in dating, <laughs> it's used mm -hmm. in like, um, just life like oh okay I didn't I couldn't get that parking spot cool not know next um, and really holding on to and, and, and self-affirming in a world that is so discouraging and so denigrating mm -hmm. it's interesting that you bring this up in this particular time of my life um, in regards to your parents and how you said you've probably only seen your mom cry a handful of times because I've recently been grappling with um this idea of like, you know, how in the mental health space, feeling our feelings is very much encouraged. And I'm a big proponent of that as somebody who cries three times a day, please tell your mom that, um, <laughs> <laughs> I call it my daily cry. I feel like I like, I don't know, sometimes at the end of the day, I feel like it just builds up and I just got to, and then there are months that I go and I'm like, wow, I'm feeling like, I don't know. Some people call it numb. Some people call it stoic. And I also like dabble into some like older philosophy, which is also <laughs> most of the philosophy that we have written history of is by white men. So it's just interesting um, to try to find like the quote unquote right approach or perhaps the most helpful one for you. And I was going to research just for myself about like this, this balance between like feeling our feelings and confronting things that are wrong and um, letting ourselves be emotional and quote unquote crazy because that's always been weaponized against women you mm -hmm. know and nervous system regulation and not know but next and all right I'm gonna like stay steady not for them but but for me because I can't be on this roller coaster all the time I'm not getting things done so I thought it was really interesting that you brought up that like perspective from from your mom's and your parents point of view 
I think I'll give an example. Um, so I recently got back on Twitter and there's, you know, like the part of the reason I was off Twitter, because there's like, I find that Twitter is like an out of sight, out of mind place. Like if you're not on there, the people aren't harassing you because they forget that you exist, which is great. It also kind of like invalidates their harassment because it's like, okay, all these years where you were fine, not thinking about me. And um, there's like this one individual who uh, was kind of like picked up right where he left off when it came to harassment towards me. And I was supposed to be going to brunch with my friends. And I found myself, like, I have gone to therapy about this. I have gone so, like, my own journey, meditation, like, figuring out what is chemical and what is my own need to just, like, regulate my feelings and breathing. And sometimes those can be the same. And I felt fine. I was like, okay, well, this doesn't affect me the same way. I'm clearly okay. But I kind of, like, sat in my bed waiting for me to have a panic attack because I was like, last time this was brought up, I fully couldn't handle it. I'm older now, I am wise-ish, -er. and I found myself just being like, oh, I'm okay. But then I was also kind of like, am I? And throughout the day, I was, you know, texting my spouse, like, uh, Atlas, and I was like, I'm okay. And it's funny, because my mom was like, <laughs> she actually came, so I live behind my mom, so she came out to the back house, and she was like, but are you okay? And I was like, she's like, are you sure? Because she was also kind of like, she kind of saw how it was before and um, I'm still okay. And there's kind of that part of me when I like do think about like this, this one, or just kind of like anytime you're, you, you know, I'm harassed online, like I can handle it now. And it's not because I have a thicker skin, it's because I have coping mechanisms and better perspective and so better support system. Um, but it's that kind of like that expectation of waiting for yourself to crumble, like, I, I had to kind of sit with myself and give myself more credit and really like say, well, you know, shout out to you, Blair, like self, like you have done so much therapy, you have such better support systems, you have better perspective, you realize that you don't live and die by what the Twitter timeline says, like, and in my early 20s, I was not like that at all. Like, I was really like, every negative thing that was said about me on the internet, I believed, I internalized, I took personally. And I realized that I have, I can get um, intrusive thoughts. I learned that about myself. I can really dive into paranoia really quickly, but I have all these mechanisms now, like um, worry management uh, from cognitive behavioral therapy, where I can take a step back and be like, okay, well, what is the end of the world for me that it'll actually look like? And recognizing that this stimulus that, that this is making me feel anxious actually isn't worth me stressing out at all. Um, and that was, that was really healthy. And so I think that's the balance, right? It's like, cause what I think sometimes uh, an approach would be would no sit there and cry and feel the feelings. But then for me to realize those feelings aren't there. So maybe that'll be helpful for you. Like in those moments where you do feel like very high emotion to honor those emotions, to figure out where they're coming from, not always validate them because they're not always valid, but that's not something I can decide for you. That has to be something you, you know, figure out for yourself and maybe with your like mental health practitioner. But then the other side of it to be like, oh no, I genuinely don't need to react to this because it's not making me reactive and to be okay with that too. Yeah. Yeah. For me personally, reacting looks like talking about it over and over and over again, which I think some people would see as like, oh, she's processing her feelings with her friends, but it's just a more socially acceptable form of rumination. So what's been the most helpful for me is, you know, something goes down, like I just created all this wedding dress drama that didn't even need to be there. Like super, I feel so silly. And that's what I was beating myself up over. I'm like, oh, how privileged of a problem am I having with my wedding dress being strapless instead of this particular cut and whatever. And my best friend called me after a couple of days and I didn't tell her anything about this situation. She was like, Hey, I heard your wedding dress came in. Like, how was that? And I was about to go into the whole story, the whole weekend fiasco I had. Be like, with, oh girl, yeah. wait till I tell you. <laughs> with the alterations lady and all these people who did me dirty and whatever. I mean, no, it wasn't that bad, but I just took a breath and I'm like, she doesn't need to know every detail of my life and every single little thought that I had over the past 72 hours. And yeah, I love my wedding dress. It fits really great. I just need to get it hemmed. And I took it into alterations on Friday. Thanks for asking, you know? That's really healthy. Because I think like sometimes when we talk about something with our friends over and over again, it can be us not, it can be us like offsetting our own validation or processing. I'm not mm -hmm. going to process it. Let me wait for my friend to react and then I'll know how to feel. Oh, 
Oh, that's going to be the, the sound bite. <laughs> I'm already <laughs> seeing it because I, I, I do think that, and it's something that it's, it's not, I guess the most appropriate to talk about in the mental health space. Cause we kind of like talk about everything and we air out everything. Um, and it's kind of a, not a problem I've been having, but just something I've been observing that like, there are a lot of things that we don't necessarily need to talk about. And a lot of things that we need to put more focus and energy and attention into like, I don't know, systems of oppression. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's a balance. Cause like you mentioned, like it being a privilege thing. And I think it's really important to like drill down to like, what does privilege mean? It's an unearned benefit that you have because of who you are. And it doesn't mean that it's the same thing as you not liking your wedding dress. Like, yeah, there's so many people who can't afford a wedding dress. The wedding industrial complex is a mess. Like as soon as you mentioned the word wedding, like I loved my florist, but also why did I have a $200 bouquet? One, I don't know how much flowers genuinely cost. Maybe that was an appropriate price. I've never bought a bouquet before. So anyway, <laughs> but it's also like, you know, you can want things and you can want things that other people don't have access to. And also recognize that you wanting those things isn't denying other people that stuff. Now, that's not always the case. Like, say that dress was made from prison labor. That's definitely a privilege issue that we have to talk about. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, but it's really like, I think one thing is that I've been really working through, and I don't know if this is helpful for you, but like figuring out what guilt is appropriate and what guilt is inappropriate. And um, looking at inappropriate guilt, it can be us like feeling like through our mental health, but I have anxiety, so I have it a lot that something should be wrong. So then you find a way for it to be like, for mm -hmm. it to be your fault versus something genuinely being wrong. And because I talk about like systems of oppression every day there, trust me, like the, the amount of work I had to do to figure out, okay, well, how do I talk about the exciting things in my life? But then also I'm talking about systems of, of oppression. I think what that genuine guilt was, was like, am I making sure that I am living my values every single day? Like if I'm going to do a video where I talk about how do we talk to customer service folks? That means that like that same, I think three, like three day period that I had like was promoting it. Um, I ordered like, you know, a delivery food and I got the wrong order. And I was like, okay, well, clearly as somebody who is living my values, I'm not going <laughs> to take it out of delivery person because it's late night and this person's probably just tired, you know? And I ended up showing the person the, the, the video, which was also really wholesome, but it's just like making sure that we're living our values and we're acknowledging the privilege, but also like not denying ourselves nice things at the same time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Especially if you're a marginalized person. I loved your recent post um, amidst more horrors. You didn't. I What I like so much about following you is that you don't jump on things very quickly. Like you really sit to think and, and you're very transparent about it. You're like, I need to gather my thoughts and feelings or I am taking time off before I bring you a smarter in seconds. And you set those boundaries consistently with your audience and then bring some black joy to the feed. Like it's, it's just as a powerful way to learn for me as a white person to see that part and that side of your life too, instead of always expecting you to be somehow serving me. Absolutely. I think that's been something to like acknowledge as well like what role am I playing in my own life and other people's lives um, and not trying to like justify everything that I do. Um, one of the things about growing up the way that I did being like kind of like the only person, but then also kind of having this like pageant energy where I love to like, I love, I love to, to put on a show. Show and tell was my day. I love show and tell. Like they were like, well, you can't do show and tell until the entire class does show and tell. Like you can't do it again. And I was like, <laughs> Sounds unfair, but makes total sense, you know, because I was a kid. <laughs> um, and really recognizing that, like, I don't have to calculate everything that I do. Um, my job that I did at Planned Parenthood, I worked in communications, um, but I also worked in crisis communications. So a lot of that job was figuring everything that could go wrong, everything the opposition could possibly say, um, mm. and then, like, making the team aware of it, and then also trying to make plans ahead of it. So I had a lot of crisis communications plans. Some of them were, like, in case of, like, a national, like, a, a natural disaster or, like, violence, but then also just, like, press. Um, and I think that sometimes, like, when I write a Smarter in Seconds, I am having a deliberate conversation with Kat, who's the director, and, like, is my, just, Kat runs everything behind the scenes, Kat Wheeler. Follow them at Sensory Savant, highly recommend. Um, but sometimes it'll be like me and Kat analyzing a script to death to the point where I don't even want to do it anymore. And I don't want to take the fun away. Sometimes I can just like, you know, have fun with it. Um, 
and yeah it takes a lot of like introspection because you don't want to be you like I, I've always said like I want to live in the world that I'm trying to create so I don't want to like deny myself the fun stuff too mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and living in the world that you're trying to create also means like speaking the language of the people that are are living in this current world so that we can like guide Get them there. a little bit more forward yeah because I think some of the times well especially like older people who have been set in their ways for so long like have you seen those videos where people just like use different words like they use their language to talk to them about racism yeah and they'll kind of like the best way yeah they like dig themselves into this hole and you're like so you agree <laughs> yeah you are exactly pretty. they're like oh so you're saying like I this is the best one from where when I worked at Planned Parenthood oh so you're just saying that birth control should be super available so that people who don't want to have kids can just not have kids like they should just be free from the vending machine and I was like yeah ideally yes and it's like <laughs> I think there's a <laughs> there's an entire twitter account but like some people just like they dig themselves in that hole oh so you're saying that i should just shouldn't judge people i should just hire somebody even if their like outfit isn't cute yeah if they're qualified correct. hire them <laughs> yeah <laughs> correct um i want to circle back to the wedding industrial complex that you brought up um do you have a smarter in seconds on that i don't but i think now that i'm like married i'm definitely going to do it because it's so interesting like um, for example, like so many people think that white symbolizes virginity. What it actually symbolized was being able to afford a dress that you only wear once. And so it's like more of a class thing than it is a purity thing and where that came from and like how that was adopted. And there's so many things that are like that, that are like misattributed. Like some folks, um, so if you look at like a suit jacket, there's like this rule uh, amongst the gentlemen that it's like, you know, like a stoplight, like you, you button like one of the buttons but you don't button the other ones I think the uh, the bottom button doesn't isn't buttoned or something mm -hmm. that was because one of the guys like during like nobility in the UK or in England could he couldn't fit his stuff so he didn't button them all the way and he needed a better tailor but instead he like stylized that like it's really interesting to yeah. look at but I think the wedding industrial complex does need to be held to account but it's so interesting how uh sometimes it our things are more expensive because it's a wedding yeah too. and that there's so many like that like it, it reminds me of um the birth industrial complex which I'm not very educated on and I know birth is like very very individual individual and sensitive but to that point the idea of like women giving birth or people who birth giving birth on their backs did like I didn't completely that didn't this. always work yeah like uh, um have you did you watch call the midwife on like my mother my mom watched the hell out of that show loved it oh. I haven't seen it I can't vouch for it but it's basically like uh, I think it's like a BBC show or something because she tends to like like the Downton Abbey like that whole type of yeah. thing Bridgerton too even though it's not on BBC um but they found like you know so so many jobs that were targeted like midwives like which were often held by like older women and you know unmarried older women those jobs being criminalized and taken away and sometimes you don't need to give birth on your back you need to be on all fours you need to be standing up you need to be like like I know stories personally from my family my my I'm not going to say who it was but um her mom went to the bathroom and it was because she was in that position she was a better better able to give birth yeah but like we've decided because you know so many cis het men have decided that this is how your body works even though they don't have that body yeah and I I heard that it was because like King Louis the 14th or whatever had some fetish and he wanted to watch his partner give birth and so he made her like you I, I can't believe you I've never, never heard, heard that but I believe it <laughs> I need to like triple fact check it um and I'll send you a, a credible sourced article because I'm pretty sure I've heard this multiple places that yeah he wanted to like watch her give birth so he made her be on her back in like a certain position and then like ever since like you said it's a class thing it was adopted as standard practice by these doctors who are all cishet men and now you know women and or I'm sorry. I haven't found a better word, You're working on word it. for Birth, people birthing people. Birth. Birthing people. Now they're all just stuck birthing in that position, even though it might be uncomfortable or not the best way perhaps for their body. So anyway, in regards to weddings and marriages, again, Blair, I could talk to you all day. You recently got married. I see so much of myself in you. Um, 
partially because you approached like your wedding and your marriage and your life in such a like this is what I'm doing for me and this is what I've educated myself on and I'm passing on this education for you to make your own decisions so similar to you I don't know if you grappled with this but you know getting married is tradition traditionally like this patriarchal construct um I don't know if you took your spouse's last name so we picked a new last name together Ali and we both like added that to our names oh I love that so we were thinking about doing something similar um my partner is a a refugee from the former Soviet Union so his last name is Russianized so we were thinking about going to the Sephardic Jewish last name and I don't mind that because it feels like very aligned to my values as like a Jewish woman. But I was definitely like laying up at night thinking like, what last names are our children going to have? Because we're adding both of them. So all our kids are going to be Imani Ali. But that sounds so nice. Ours is like so long (laughs) and so complicated with these letters that don't even exist in the English language. And like, it's, I, I I don't want to like, sometimes I think like I don't want to like overcomplicate or overcomplicate their lives or their little label on the cubbies although I'm sure it's not the biggest (laughs) sacrifice to make but um it's something I think about a lot so I want to know I read your article I'm a I was obsessed with it I sent it to I sent it to Stan about you not saying till death do us apart at your vows yeah I think the biggest thing for me I think so there's multi-layers um one, it didn't feel practical or right because the till death do us part, I'm a very spiritual person. I don't feel like if one of us passes, that's going to be the end of what we are together. So like one, incorrect, like it could be longer than death, you know. Um, the other thing is divorce is real. Like, and I think one of the things that we talked about as we were like, you know, this was probably even before we were engaged, but I remember Akeem saying, you know, we could separate. And I was like, oh my gosh, why would you say that? And um, his response was just very like, matter of fact, like, babe, like we could have a kid, the kid could pass away, that could change our dynamic, like who knows how we're going to react to something in the future. And it wasn't even like, we're trying to manifest something horrible happening to us, but like life happens. And I think that when we say things like till death do us part, and it's supposed to be a vow that you're making to somebody, if that's not one, what you're it's what you believe you should be signing up for or accurate to you. Don't just do it because other people are doing it. And I think that's one of the biggest things in marriage is like, especially weddings. It's it's just doing something because everybody else does it. Um, for me, like it was really important for me not to wear a white dress. Not because like I still like, you know, bought I, I've worn the, the my wedding dress since, but I just like didn't want a white dress because I just like what it symbolized for me in Catholic school versus what the historical context was. I wasn't cool with that. So I'm just like, not for me. I'm not going to shade people who do it. It's just like, you know, taking somebody's last name versus not. There's no one feminist correct thing to do. You just have to do the thing that's right for you. Because I think one of the things that feminism is about is about choice. And that should be part of your marriage as well. Mm, Amen to that. We definitely say like together forever. And that feels that feels really good to me, you know, right now that feels really, really good to me. And I read your article and I always joke that I've been through four divorces and I've never been married because vicariously through my parents. Thank you. Um, it's, it was a lot for me to unpack like marriage and the giant fear of divorce. Um, and I think that like reading your article and your new approach to your vows and everything, it, it helped subside that fear that like, dying not married is not a failure do you know what I mean like your relationship isn't a failure yeah and and I honestly just made this this joke to Atlas today I was like um he was talking like one of his career ambitions and I was like do that with your second wife and it was like a joke that I like didn't make with like any shade or any anticipation of like I was like that ain't me you know but I think that um if you look at the context of like and and some of the work that I with honestly one of the first activism things that I ever got involved with was with the Genesee Foundation which Halle Berry was supporting and it was around domestic violence and having shelters for largely you know women who were you know having to escape really violent relationships and um when I posted about what we said in our vows somebody who worked at a domestic as a lawyer working with interpersonal and domestic violence said can I can I put this up in my uh 
um, my office because so many people stay in relationships that don't serve them because they are so afraid of not being in that relationship and not so much that, but the expectations that society has placed onto them. And I just think too, and I was talking about this with a, a couple that we just met um, this past week, um, Novi and Malcolm who are married or who are uh, engaged to be married. Um, but I think as black people, when our, you know, ancestors were literally owned and marriage can be so much about ownership and the exchange of property, it didn't make sense for us to participate in something that just like felt so deeply not connected to us. Like, I don't want to participate in ownership as Black people with the legal right to marry that didn't always have, that didn't always exist, um, and do that in a way that just, we have to make it our own inherently. And that's what it, we even talked about in um, our celebrant, Dr. Stephen Finley. He gave like, it was like half TED Talk, half wedding. Um, he talked about the anti-Black history of the United States. Like I was like, my friend was like, Claire, of course your wedding would talk about slavery. And I'm like, of course, because, you know, marriage is already political. Like it is something that has to do with power. And, you know, you don't have to have a political ceremony, but I think that you don't have to have an answer right now about what you do with your kids, you know, but to think about it and to talk about that together, I think is one of the ways that you deepen and enrich in your relationship because you're not just doing things because other people have done them. You're doing them because you and boyfriend want to do them. Mm -hmm. I want to ask a simple, but loaded question. Why did you personally decide to get married? Especially given that, you know, it's becoming more and more popular for women specifically to not want to marry or not really need to sign the documents per se, but just commit to long-term partnership. Why was that important for you? And so Alex. hilariously, no, no, I love that. Cause people, they're like, so why did you do it? Honestly, I got so many questions like that right after I posted that our vows and I got like emails from like the inside, like some no. folks who call it inside. I know you're not I, asking in an antagonizing way. <laughs> well, no, not at all. And I'm asking because I, 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 I want better words to communicate why I want to get married. So again, selfishly motivated. <laughs> oh yeah. No, I think that for me, like in the United States, a couple doesn't have you know, shared rights in a legal context. Although I will shout out the Chosen Family Law Center. They're absolutely fantastic. Diana Adams um, runs their like legal initiatives. So if you are in a relationship with someone and you do want to have the legal rights that are afforded to married couples, definitely check out the, the Chosen Family Law Center. Um, but before I knew that existed, I was really kind of under this impression that you can't have like legal rights. Like, you know, the example that was always used during the, you know, same gender marriage debate was what if somebody gets sick or like, you know, what about these all these different rights I mean there's little things that really I didn't realize the amount of privilege that comes with getting married until I got married like not just being able to extend like benefits on like a card membership or like going to rent a car but the way that people treat you um I definitely understand why people participate in marriage for those benefits because wow like I feel like I'm now viewed by my extended family like an actual adult like oh I'm a married woman suddenly you can't boss me around which is so weird and kind of I, I like it but it's also like cringe but it's like I'll take it but you need to think amongst yourselves and reflect why that is but thank <laughs> you in the meantime but I wanted to get married because you know we had been together for so long at that point I definitely think that while I didn't have my like marriage like my wedding ceremony on a Pinterest board or in my mind is like what the perfect wedding looked like. I did know that marriage was important to me as something that, you know, in my own mind defines a relationship. Um, and then also because it made this partnership formal. And we, as we just like, we were in um, a store the other day. This was actually, my, might've been last night. And I was like, should I buy you your own umbrella? And Atlas was like, no we have your umbrella. And I was like, but it's my umbrella. And they were like, actually, babe, it's both of our umbrellas because that's what you decided when we got married. And it's just kind of like this constant affirmation of like us being committed to ourselves and, you know, choosing each other in this moment in a way that is different than we did before. Um, so it's kind of abstract, but I think that it's been really beautiful. And the other thing is like, it has changed our relationship, but I'm also a big proponent that if you're going to marry somebody and you plan on living with them once you get married, live with them before. Because I think that like 
you should know each other fully in those different ways. Um, but it is nice. And then also we do plan on having kids at some point. And it is nice to also have those shared parental rights that come with marriage um, and stuff like that too. So I think for us, it was like uh, an acknowledgement of like the mature, the maturation of the maturing of our relationship, but then also an honoring of the promises that we made in coupled with the like political and legal benefits that you get from being married. Yeah. I was really shocked when I was trying to do a joint trust with my mom. Um, and I was told that I, a joint trust is only reserved for married couples. And I asked the paralegal my words exactly, because I get a little, <laughs> I get a little sassy when I disagree with something, but my words exactly are. So you're telling me that I can create a trust with this dude I met on hinge, but not my own mother who birthed me, who I've lived with, who I trust with my entire life but I can't go into a property with her under this particular legal uh, instance that we were trying and to do. And that's on purpose because then you would have throughout U.S. history, mothers and their daughters and mothers and their sons having money separate from the control of another man because that's a lot of what marriage is in this country. And so it is worth thinking about. Like, why are these benefits ben- benefits exclusive? Uh, yeah, sorry. It's like, why are these benefits exclusive to married couples? And then you start thinking about like, oh my goodness, so there was the same gender marriage debate, but maybe it needs to be like, not just married rights for married people or like why are we treating like it's just so it's so layered so I feel like after being married I have more reasons to be married than I did before yeah yeah for sure I completely agree um I want to ask one more question about your personal identity and I didn't want to lead with this because it felt like a little too basic and you said I'm not basic which was the biggest compliment ever like thank you you said that off the air but could you repeat it just so we have record oh no definitely (laughs) So y'all, Mary was like, I feel like I have the basic questions for you. And I was like, well, yeah, but you're not basic. So they're not going to be asked in the basic way. <laughs> well, thank and you they haven't so much for me. Um, well, now I do want to ask a, a basic question about why did you decide to become Muslim? Because from my understanding, you chose the religion um, in your late teens, maybe early 20s. Not 100% sure. It was the early me- 20s, I think. I'm bad at math. No, it was early. It was early 20s. Um I was actually in the same place that I am now, right now I'm in Louisiana, and I was in Louisiana when I chose Islam, and I think the interesting thing, so I grew up kind of an edgelord, like I was an edgy, edgy girl, I lived in Hot Topic, I only wore black, like I think I would be so cringed out to see the amount of color that I wear on a regular basis, like I think teenage wear would have been like, you are so disappointing, like I would be like, so put off but maybe also not I but don't it's know. so I'm funny because in to... in 2023 wearing color is edgy you know yeah it's true <laughs> I feel like yeah so maybe I'm still kind of edgy it's just in a different way um but like I just remember like being the angstiest kid like wearing like studded like Steve Madden or like Doc Martens like I was just like not goth but like goth light maybe but I knew all those songs and um I was also like very a religious like I didn't have respect for people who needed spirituality or wanted spirituality or believed in God or gods and I was um not as bad as like kind of like those very annoying atheists that I think we all left in with their fedoras in the early 2000s or at least I hope but you know what I'm talking about um but I think that I didn't recognize that like at a core level I am very religious like I am very spiritual when like something great happens, I'm quick to say like, Alhamdulillah, like God bless. And that goes to like my family that goes to my upbringing. But I think that my decision to become Muslim also connected to my parents never really like steering me in one religious direction or one career direction. My parents are very like hands off. They're like, whatever makes you happy and successful and not dangerous to yourself or others is great. Like, you know, they're very much like, you know, free spirits in that way and wanted me to be. Um, But I think that I, at a certain point in my 20s, realized that Christianity wasn't a good fit for me. And that was before I was in, uh, I was aware of people like Reverend Jackie Lewis, who do a really beautiful talk about, uh, who do really beautiful talks about um, how we can connect the story of Jesus and the reality of how Jesus was used in the United States in a way that uplifts Black people instead of bringing Black people down. And I didn't really even recognize that was a possibility. And so I think that like at a time when I was really burnt out by the work that I was doing while I was in college and just kind of feeling lost, 
I recognized I kind of needed to do something for myself that was outside of it needed to be in the realm of God. And uh, it was also a time where I started going to the mosque because I was starting to organize with Muslim folks in Louisiana. Um, and it was just this really well warm and like welcoming space. But I think it's so funny because as I was like self-teaching, because my friends who were also Muslim were like, Blair, I'm not going to tell you what this part of the Quran means. You tell me what it means and we can have a discussion, but I'm not going to like teach you my Islam. You have to figure out your own Islam. At no point did I like read through and like learn and like understand the Hadith and was like, oh, okay, well, since I'm bisexual, I can't do this. Like that wasn't until like after. And then I got to see like the cultural aspects of Islam combined with like the religious aspects and that beautiful mantra that Muslims are not perfect. Islam is perfect. Um, but it's so funny because when people are like trying to tell me I can't be Muslim, there will always be somebody in the comment that'll be like, you shut up. Like she chose to be Muslim. Your parents are Muslim. Like, you know, like, and, and we'll get into that banter. But I think that um, more than it being Islam specifically, I think that everybody at some point in their life needs to choose something that's right for them that didn't come from their parents or their partner or partners or their kids. They have to do something that makes sense for them. And I think that really made this shift in my life because I, you know, figured out what I needed for me. And sometimes that can literally be somebody's anti-racism journey. It can be their spiritual journey. It can be their yoga practice. They can, it can be their self-care practice. But I think it's really essential to figure out something that you do for you um, and maybe a higher power if that makes sense for you. If not, that's also fine too, because it brings a new level of consciousness and honor to yourself that I think is really essential for somebody to fully be actualized because if you go through your life never having done that have you really lived for yourself I would say no but that's also just my perspective what I'm hearing you say is that there needs to be some kind of like purpose beyond yourself so you have somewhere to turn toward whether that's a people a community um, some kind of practice somewhere somewhere to go something to be some something to learn about and study that really feels um, aligned and exciting that can like just reground you in your own values too. Yeah. And I think it can also be something that you were born into, but choosing it for yourself in adulthood, I think is really essential because then you're saying, is this right for me? If yes, that's mm -hmm. a beautiful answer. If no, maybe find something else, but that could be everything from your name. Like it could be really anything, but I think it's so fundamental because humans like to be a human I grew up believing that humans are supposed to be living in service to one another which I think is really beautiful but I think to some point you have to be in service to yourself and that's really what drew me to Islam was like the emphasis on community care um but it's funny because I always tell my mom like whenever my mom or my dad do something uh I'm like oh that's so Muslim of you like that's so Islamic <laughs> how did they like how did they perceive it or how did they react when oh you they love it so yeah. my my dad, um, he kind of grew up in the set the sixties and seventies. So a lot of his friends, you know, changed their names. Like you know, during that time period, like Kareem Abdul Jabbar, like folks were changing their names and like becoming and, and figuring out ways to connect to blackness and to spirituality in a way that was outside of white supremacy in the U.S., which unfortunately mm -hmm. does have to do with evangelical Christianity. Um, and I think that so my dad was very familiar. My mom, on the other hand, it took some some getting used to. I think that she kind of had a very um, tainted view of Islam that was really like tied into her consumption of like the news and like morning talk shows. Um, but I think she also recognized that like her daughter isn't stupid. Stupidity doesn't exist. And she's going to do stuff that like that I'm going to do stuff that makes sense for me. And I think over time she was able to to really accept it more. Um, but at first it was definitely a growing pain, but I'm also like, like, okay, so like right now, so I got my nose pierced, so I only have like the retainer thing in right now. Ooh, um, I love my dad, it. Thank <laughs> you. My dad really is upset that I got my nose pierced, but I was telling him, I was like, you have to be disappointed in me about something or else we don't actually have a daughter, father, <laughs> you know, dynamic. It's, it's the law. Like you have to have, you have to disappoint <laughs> your parents. So like, if it's just a nose ring, yeah. mom, if it's just me converting to Islam, I feel like it's important for us to like realize that we're different people. Um, mm -hmm. At least that's what I tell them and they laugh. So. Well, I think it has so such big truthful weight to it because um, that's a, 
very similar to the journey that I had to go on with my mom. I, I was like, mom, you have to trust your parenting enough to know that you raised me to be my own person, just like you were your own person, just like you did things grandma didn't agree with, just like, you know, you had to move to a different country, a different state and build your own life. Like I'm doing the same. I am falling in your footsteps, even if right now it feels like we're so different, you know? hundred percent. I'm going to tell them that next time that they have to trust their own parenting. Cause I am who I am because of them. I am just as headstrong as they made me out to be. Um, and that's what it has been like, like, you know, living right behind my parents after moving away. Cause I, I went to, I moved to Louisiana when I was 18. And then I just like kind of moved, I went to DC, then I went to New York and living back at home, they're kind of being confronted with the person that they created. And <laughs> it doesn't always go it's always because of who, like who they made me. And sometimes it's me doing the same things as them, but it's just, it's really cute, you know? And I think that it's, it's probably one of my favorite things right now is just kind of getting to hang out with my parents, not as them, my parents, but them, my friends, which has been yeah. really sweet. Yeah. That's a really cool thing. And, and being an adult too, for me, um, Blair, I feel like this golden thread has been your parents. So I <laughs> hope to meet them one day. I just, they sound really, really cool. Um, and I knew we would run out of talking points before, or sorry, I knew we would run out of time before we would run out of talking points. So we didn't even get to your beauty brand and so much other work that you do. We would be here for hours, but is there anything you really want to leave our listeners with, whether it's um, something to think about or some kind of call to action, anything of your own that you want us to support? Um, I think right now what makes what's most poignant is, especially like when we're recording this, is that a lot of folks made a lot of promises in 2020 to be better, like more intentional people um, and, and fighting white supremacy, which to just reemphasize what we're seeing right now is, you know, it being anti-Black, but also anti-Semitic. So don't forget to, and I'm, I know I'm preaching to you, but like just for your listeners to not forget to include Jewish folks in your activism alongside Black folks and folks who are at the intersections. Um, but I'd really recommend um, uh, two books. One is mine, so I'm biased, uh, and it's called uh, Read This to Get Smarter. Um, and it's it kind of is like a primer on all these conversations, but also has ways for you to internalize it. So that way you're not just reading about identity or race and racism and anti-Semitism, but you're figuring out like, oh, how do I prevent myself and my community from participating in those things? Um, and then another book is uh, Reclaiming Our Space by Feminista Jones fantastic book um, written by my mentor who uh, talks about how Black folks and Black women in particular have used social media to raise our voices. Um, and I think that uh, those books together, especially Feministas, will help you kind of understand the current moment and where you fit into it. Because I've always said, and I remember like learning this from when I was like a kid, that like when major things happen in history, I remember reading history books and being like, what was everybody doing? And the realizing that the people who are protesting wasn't everybody. And you can really decide, are you going to be somebody who doesn't do anything? Um, or are you going to be somebody who takes action? And that action can look like so many different things. It can look like you challenging your, the people in your life on something. It can look like you just being better to customer service workers. Like it could just be anything, but do something because you don't want somebody, some kid reading about you reading about this current era a hundred years from now and wondering about you and the things that you didn't do. At least that's what helps keep me motivated. Oh yeah. That personally motivates the shit out of me. For me, it's like my future children asking like, but mom, where were you? Like, I don't, I don't want to not have anything to say. Um, so that that's very motivating. I will link both of those books in the description so people can easily buy. And also if somebody can't necessarily afford to buy, I'm sure that both of these are available at public library. At the library, make yes. sure to request at your local public library. Um, I'm a library nerd. Make sure to get your library card. They are one of the few, in addition to the post office, socialist um, uh, organizations that we still have going on in the United States. Uh, so yeah. yeah, definitely support your local public libraries. That's my sign off for sure. <laughs> the, the library has made me such a better reader because there are deadlines. And then you have to return there the are. book. So I'm like, I have to Also, they it. have video games. Like maybe you don't like books. Like I have an audio book. I recorded my own audio book. So if you didn't hate the sound of my voice, you can see me struggle to read for what was 10 hours for my, it's not a 10 <laughs> hour audio book. I just had to say every sentence three times. Um, but yeah, just get a video game from the library. Go to the library. 
Yeah. Library is a beautiful place and you are a beautiful pl person, Blair. Thank you so much for being here and for serving us with your full heart and soul. Thank you, Mary.